Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to week three gallery talks. We have an exciting talk for you tonight. Three women who are masters of many media and they teach with us multiple weeks as a result because it's so difficult to choose. They're all excellent teachers. Our first speaker tonight is Janet Kozacek. Janet and I actually met at a craft show and we kind of picked each other up. I found out all the stuff that she could do. Um, she speaks Chinese. She has been a translator in China and uh, lived and did her master's uh, work there. Com was the first, I think, American to complete a master's uh, at the special school in China. And she's going to speak with you tonight. Her class this week is on Chinese calligraphy and who better than Janet to teach that class. Okay. Uh, 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 just a, a, a slight correction. Um, okay. My master's was at Parsons School of Design, but I did do graduate study at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in, in Beijing. Um, I suppose you could say it was a lot of work that, that um, was towards something that you could call a master's, but it's um, technically uh, something different. It's just an advanced study. Um, so my work makes use of uh, cultural and linguistic overlays. Some of my work is um, very obvious and with regard to um, my uh, use of the Chinese language, I want to screen share here, but uh, I'm having trouble. Uh, all right. Oh, need to remove the spotlight. Is that better? Okay. All right, I'm going to maximize. All right, so the calligraphy I'm using, it's sometimes um, very obvious because there are actual characters in what I'm using. So we're going to look a little bit at that. Uh, let's see. Uh, ah, I'm looking for my my program. There we are. Sorry for the delay. So, all right, well, look at this one. I have a a, a piece that is uh, right. Ah, um, uh, there. If you could see that. So this is just a piece of calligraphy that I had um, studied, and it says "Sha Jia Su Rong Dan Qing Nan Sha." Or the sunset, it's, it's a sunset, it's as if it's melting. And it's because of that, it's so very hard to capture. And so in a kind of east-west overlay, I make it look very much like a, uh, like a Franz Klein, even though I'm uh, using actual characters instead of just shapes. And this is a seal. When I, I studied seal script for a while, and it just says um, eternal joy. So we'll look at another one. And that also uses a lot of calligraphy in it. It's a, a triptych. The first, the left panel is, left panel is a chair with tape on it. The right panel is also a chair. Whoops. Uh, so we'll look at that. So you see in the chair, there's a, a lot of symbols of bondage. And so that's what the piece is about. And uh, here you see a lot of little reproductions in charcoal of, of Netsuke, which is a Japanese um, small 
buckle-like tool that's used for um, securing knotted ropes and tethers. And this is a tether too that I, I got um, off of a, a Japanese painting. And so the, the central, so the theme is about bondage. And so that, what I use um, Chinese in there is from a, an old poem. I'm bringing up the central panel. So the central panel is a cultural overlay because it has a poem from John Skelton and then another poem that's calligraphed in ink underneath, um, also about a parrot. The first one is the skull poem about parrot and here is the bondage. Um, those are actually called blood knots. And I, I actually had to study knots and knotting in order to come up with these. And I actually used, um, ropes and 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 uh, tried my hand at making all these knots. So um, the poem here is about bondage, but I'm very interested in um, re-looking at history and interpretation and how East versus West changes our perspective on how we interpret something. So this poem in Chinese is An Nan Yuan Jin Hong Ying Wu. And this is a, actually a very common poem by uh, Bai Ju Yi, and it's about um, the bondage of the parrot. And the reason why I was interested in this poem is because when we Google this online, we always come up with the Whaley interpretation. Right. And in the Whaley interpretation, the, the poem goes something like, oh, this this parrot is such a remarkable bird and he's so intelligent and literate and talented. And, and so what they did and then he comes up with this, the, these strange forces and then they, whoever they are, put him in a cage and, and won't let him out because that's what they do always do to um uh, talented and, and intelligent intellectuals. Well, if you look at the actual poem, it, it literally says um, in, in Annan, there was a red parrot. That's about right. And his coloring is like a peach blossom and his voice is like a person. And um, he can write, yes, he is talented and literary. literary. So what, year will he ever leave his cage? So there was nothing about someone putting him in there or some strange forces suppressing his intellectual prowess. And so one could possibly interpret it as meaning the parrot himself, uh, the literary person, is his existence is circumscribed maybe by his own intellect, by um, following uh, too many rules. So it's kind of interesting that there are different ways to interpret this. All right. Other work that I do may make use of Chinese characters, but they're a little more of a cultural overlay like this one. which has an overlay of very ancient Chinese. This is seal script characters, but then you also have these images that are classical Greek images, you know, kneeling figures taken from uh, studies I made of statues. And then, um, so it says the, the heaviness, the heaviness of Western culture, and this says Greek culture, but it says Greek culture, but it's written in ancient Chinese. And way down below, there's a little linguistic puzzle because I love puzzles. So if you look at this part, it has three Chinese words. It says an, ni, and ma. And that is a, a puzzle. And we'll decipher that. Uh, here we go. Uh, 
And there it is, it's a bilingual riddle. The first part on every side of that character says woman, and a woman plus a roof means safe or tranquil, and you pronounce it on, and then a woman next to this character equals knee for a nun. And then a woman next to a horse is the word for mother. So you string them together, like you saw at the bottom of that drawing, it says anima. And anima in Jungian terms is the female spiritual aspect of men. Oh, so it's just a clever little riddle. All right, just a couple more and then we'll go. So sometimes the, um, Calligraphy I'm using isn't quite as obvious. Instead, I'm just using, instead of meaning, the um, calligraphic, uh-oh, have a storm coming in. We have, I just use calligraphic form. Oh dear. All right, we have to go back. We have to go back and pick that up again. So it's thundering here. So we have a little bit of disruption. I, I beg your pardon. Uh, oh, it's still not coming up. All right. Now, here we go. So hopefully you can see him. So this particular piece, it's um, an ekphrastic piece, or actually you could call it a double ekphrastic piece, because it is a man reading a poem, and he's reading a poem about these calligraphic pieces. So I like the way he looked reading that poem about the calligraphy pieces, and so I made a drawing based on a photograph I took of him reading the poetry. So it's a, a, a double ekphrastic work. He's reading an ekphrastic poem, then I'm making uh, um, another artwork based on his interpretation of an artwork. And um, I used a little bit of liberties here because he is extracting meaning from looking at these figures and writing poetry about them. And uh, he's pull, almost pulling that thread right off of the page, um, as in a thread of meaning, okay? And I am going to stop here because we have a, a thunderstorm coming on. So I beg your pardon. <laughs> Short but sweet, right? Thank you, Janet. Imaginative, creative, intelligent, and whimsical. I love your sense of humor. Uh, next, we're going to Linda Harrison Parsons. Uh, Linda's changed her geographic location. And hopefully there's no storm out there in Arizona. Um, Linda and I've known each other quite some while. We were both uh, some of the initial group that founded Noma Gallery. <laughs> Um, and she has moved west and consequently uh, since she's such an international traveler uh, moving west has sometimes influenced her body of work but she still relies on her trip to Africa for inspiration for example and photographs of sunsets and has a delightful sense of mixed media. Let's see what you've, and nature, wildlife. Let's see what you have for us tonight, Linda. Okay, let's see. I'm going to share a little PowerPoint with you. And um, just on a weather report, in Arizona, we're in what call, is called monsoon season. And so at any given moment, we can have clouds rolling in with sandstorms or thunderstorms. And lately, we've been having a little bit of both. So if I lose you, that's probably why. But for the moment, the skies are looking just a little overcast and not thunderous. So, but 
So I thought I would start out with just a little bit of a some of the things we're going to use in the class this week. Let me get this all the way to the uh, slideshow part. Ah, I hate when it does that. Move. Slideshow. From beginning. There we go. And, you know, it is uh, kind of a carryover from the first week's class. So the first week's class was about abstraction. And, you know, in that we also talked about, you know, the our point of perspective. And, you know, I think of perspective in the, I guess, more literal terms and looking out at the horizon, looking up, looking down, you know, one point perspective, two point perspective, and introducing that into drawing. Um, I ex talk to my students all the time about the importance of drawing. If uh, you have a strength in drawing, you can pretty much do anything of just taking it over. It's one of the things that I've always loved, the line, uh, light and dark and line work. And so we're, you know, this week we're working kind of in the abstract, but also with, you know, taking it to more drawing aspects of the abstract and adding lots and lots of different mediums. So we're started out today with just kind of looking at graphite and charcoal and using a simple drawing in graphite and then, you know, using the lights and the darks to develop that and moving forward with that and you know where do you go from that to continue with the drawing medium and making it a mixed medium or making it more abstracted. So you can add watercolor, you can add charcoal, you can add pastel, um, you can just kind of play around with the medium as much as you want. There is no restriction and so I've left it up to the students to let me know if there's something they want to experiment with and to take it a little bit beyond what I'm introducing them. I give them lots of techniques and lots of information and then encourage them to use their own hand to create what they want to create. So from last week's class, or the first week's class, we used uh, white charcoal on black paper and they were only allowed to draw the light, what light they saw, and they had to let the black paper create the rest of the image. And so we're doing a little bit of that this week too, but doing a little bit more in the reverse. So they had to start out drawing the dark on a mid-tone paper and then adding the light. And then later on they had to draw the light and then add the dark to a mid-toned paper. So they're creating their own toned paper or using a pre-toned paper and just kind of moving forward with that and seeing, you know, what they can experiment with. It's all about what ifs this week. What if you did this? What if you did that? And the um, eagle is done on charcoal. So take charcoal, tone your paper with the background. It's a powdered charcoal, very dry. What happens if you wet it? So you spritz a little bit of water on it, you let it drip, you let it run, and then from there you see what imagery talks to you. So you don't necessarily start out with an idea that, all right, this is going to be this, because it never works that way. And so you, you've got to allow yourself to have a little flexibility. So you create this background and then you look at it for a few minutes. Maybe you put it away and say, I'll come back to that later, make another one. And then you look at it when it's nice and dry and you go, I see an eagle in there. And then you start creating the image from there. And it's charcoal and pastel. Um, you know, two simple mediums, but part wet, part dry. So I wet the background and then dry medium on the top. So what if you used wood? So we did the same technique, but used it on wood panel. And you know, just kind of move forward with that. So th these are all about what ifs. What if I change this direction? What if I change that direction? So I move a little bit forward. One of my passions is Africa. Um, one of the reasons I like Arizona is it has a lot of similarities to Africa. Uh, the red soil, the succulent plants, the heat. Um, so all of that kind of you know, goes together. I was amazed at how many similarities there were. And I've been to Africa a few times and, and you know, hope to get back again in a couple of years maybe. But, you know, this is one of the little elephant photos that I took and using coffee staining to create the background. Coffee staining, tea staining, uh, watercolor staining are all very old techniques. Uh, the Renaissance used staining uh, when they had just a white sort of paper and they wanted to add something to the background uh, just for their sketch purposes using Conte or any type of a charcoal. 
they often stain the paper, but they tended to just stain the entire paper, uh, where I just throw coffee on it. If I have a little leftover and, you know, a number of people go, why waste coffee? Well, you know, if it's just a few drops, you can afford to waste it and throw it on the paper and create a little abstract background. And then from there, again, let it talk to you and tell you what it's going to be. And on this one, it told me I was going to be a little elephant. So I love elephants and you'll see a number of them. I love just African wildlife, wildlife in general. And again, using a little bit more coffee, creating one of Linda's favorites, the zebra, or if I guess I should pronounce it correctly, zebra. So that's how they say it in South Africa. And uh, we had a lovely guide and loved his accent. <laughs> But, it, you know, they're just fun to create. I love the pattern. You can't get more abstract or more defined in a line than trying to draw up on. They're just amazing creatures. And going a little bit further with taking the line work. So tomorrow we'll be exploring stippling, which is making little dots to create your patterns. And so we will go and create a background color, something abstract using watercolor, coffee, tea, whatever happens to you know, present itself tomorrow. And then pen and ink and creating an image on top of it. And we'll keep them small so that they'll have a chance to finish them because stippling can take a long time. This is done with just the line work and it's pen and ink on coffee stained paper on handmade paper. And it took a while to do this. I had gone to France a couple of years ago and uh, I wanted to have this piece finished for a show. I didn't get there. It took me way longer than I thought it was going to take. And I don't do architecture very often, but this was, we went right after Notre Dame had caught on fire. And there was some smudging on the paper that I liked because it made me think of the smoke and the residue that was left. And so I left the smudges that were on the paper and then did the coffee staining. And then I even kept the scaffolding in the background. And so it was just, it was more of a memorial memory piece for me and decided that I just was going to finish it. Even if it didn't get on a show, I just wanted to do the piece just as the memory. But the same kind of line technique, uh, using hatching and cross hatching, where you're just making straight lines and overlaying them to create some of the depth. And I thought it was an interesting perspective because you're on the ground looking up at these and, you know, the power is still there. And then to end it, my um, reputation is in these fun little tree pieces that I do. And they were small when I first started them because that was how the challenge started. I was trying to figure out how to make my trees small so that I could use, you know, put them into galleries for small pieces instead of having these really large pieces. Uh, it's very nice and fun to draw very large trees, but you, sometimes you need to scale it down and I have difficulty making big trees little. So I uh, gave myself a challenge to create these smaller tree pieces and the drippy trees became kind of a thing that I got known for and I do a lot of them. And you're using watercolor crayons, watercolor pencils, watercolor, allowing it to drip and run wherever it will be and then adding the trees on top. And that's kind of where, you know, we will conclude our class with doing some of these fun drippy tree pieces and the line work using that to follow what the drips tell you and creating the root system and then developing the tree with that. So that's kind of my perspective on things. I'm looking up, I'm looking down, I look at nature everywhere and I just try and make it be as true and honest as I can. So. I think that's a little bit of everything on mine, so I'll stop my share there, and I think that about covers it. A mute. Linda, you're muted. Thank you, yes. Thank you, Linda. I can see quite a few comparisons between your use of line and Janet Kozicek's calligraphy. We'll come back to that once we give uh, Kelsey Wales a chance to present her colored pencil unit. Um, she's, she's a master of colored pencil. 
her technique is flawless. Uh, she makes colored pencil drawings look like jewels. Um, and she'll talk to you about the techniques she uses, a lot of layering. She almost burnishes the paper with her pencils and it, it gives a, a gorgeous look to the surface. Tell us about your work, Kelsey. Hello, nice to see you, thank you. Um, so I do colored pencil stuff. Um, so I'll share my screen in a bit, but uh, a lot of what I do, I'll do like illustration and portraiture and stuff like that. Um, so the nice thing about colored pencils is that most colored pencils that you can buy in a store, whether they're Crayola or, you know, a store's generic brand, is that it's basically colorful powder mixed in with wax, um, which makes for a really good smeary color pencil. But the colored pencils that I am using most of the time and that I'm encouraging my students to use are Prismacolor pencil. And what's cool about these is that uh, the uh, ingredients that they put into them also include a little bit of a clay, which makes them blend together. So they almost look like paint or oil pastel and they are able to be layered so high on top of each other that anything you can draw with these things has a really um, colorful and illuminated quality, which I really love about these. So uh, in our class, we're learning about different techniques to shade with these, to blend with these. Um, we're learning a lot of the same sort of effects that you would see in Linda's class. We're learning about stippling, we're learning about hatching and cross hatching, and how to use these tools to make really interesting uh, drawings and explore textures and things like that. So we're having a lot of fun sort of exploring and seeing what else can we add to them. So I'll share my screen. Boop. All right. So, oh, hey, that's me. Um, so I've been using colored pencils since I was about 14. And one of the reasons for that um, is that colored pencils are incredibly user friendly. They're easy to find. They're not terribly expensive and they're accessible to almost everybody. You know, if you don't do art a lot, as an adult, you probably used colored pencils when you were a kid in school, in your art classes or in your regular classes. So most people have like kind of an idea of colored pencils, even if it's very basic. You know, especially um, over COVID and people spending more time at home, um, colored pencils have made a huge resurgence in popularity because they are just relaxing and they're easy to work with. They blend together beautifully. Um, Linda had shared and Maria had shared an article talking about how popular these art materials are that are sort of almost considered like a child's art supply, but you can do really cool things with them and they're relaxing, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's how I had gotten my first colored pencils. My parents said, well, these are easy to, to get a hold of, you know, this kid's 14, they should, she should like these very much. And I still have that set and I still use them every day. I use them in class today with my students. Um, and I guess I should actually present this so it shows up a little bigger. So there we go. So the nice thing about these pencils is that they're incredibly versatile. So you can put layers and layers and layers on top of each other and each layer of color shows through. Um, depending on how hard you press on your pencils. So I'm a huge fan of putting as much color as I possibly can into every drawing I make, whether it's supposed to be there or not. Um, the fact that you can add so many colors and textures into something is something that I love. Adding those little details is my favorite thing. So like this little detail here of this person's sort of like chin ear area, there's so many colors that you can see there that it's just really fun to do with lots of little lines. It's really relaxing um, and it's fun to do. Um, you can make colored pencils really textured or really smooth, which is a fun thing to explore. Um, some artists like a lot of texture on their work. Some people like making it very smooth. And the nice thing about colored pencils is that because they sit on top of paper, you can layer them a lot, but you can also put other mediums on top of it. So they're a really versatile thing to use if you like mixed media. So I'm sure um, Linda has that in her classes as well. 
So for our highlights, we're going to talk about how can we add in some white paint or can we do marker lines over something to make it show up a little brighter. Um, if you don't necessarily want the color of paper to show through and maybe your hands are a little too ouchy from drawing so much that you don't want that white paper to show through. Can you use a marker over top of your colored pencils to fill in that space? So they're a really forgiving medium. Um, they allow for a lot of experimentation. So it's really hard for people to use colored pencils and have their work look exactly like someone else's because everyone's going to translate it differently. So on this like detail shot, we can see like some cross hatching and colorful layers on some clothing and on this person's hands. And there's just a really simple addition of some white highlights on there just to make it really pop with that contrast. Um, again, because colored pencils sit on top of the paper and they don't soak into it, you can add other things on top of it that you might not be able to do as easily otherwise. So this is a section of some armor from one of the Black Panther movies. Um, but to make that armor look shiny and smooth uh, more effectively, um, I was able to use some acrylic paint on top of colored pencil to really make those two mediums work out well. And what's nice is that if you make a mistake, usually with paint, you're in a bad situation. But if you're using paint on top of colored pencils, and if you make a mistake, you can take that pencil and you can draw over it or you can scrape it off because the paint is sitting on top of pencil. So you can layer things to help you and you can get rid of some of those layers sometimes, which is nice. It's nice to know that colored pencils are going to help you out if you make a mistake. If you experiment and it doesn't go the way you want it to, it's going to work out okay. Um, so the pencils have such a bright uh, concentration of color pigment in them that they allow for you to be able to play with color really effectively. So this is, again, an example of me drawing a portrait of somebody, throwing in as many colors as I can using different layers, pressing lightly on my pencil, pressing more firmly on my pencil. And we played a lot with this in class today. Just getting used to how do we how do we take something that we write with and turn it into something that's going to give you a lot of depth and a lot of lights and darks. Um, so here's some of the things I've done in the past. This is a portrait of Freddie Mercury. So he himself is done in colored pencils. There is a little bit of white highlight with pen, but one of the nice things is, is that you can also um, splatter paint on top of it. So I had done colored pencil blending in the background with this sort of blues and black colors. And then I covered the whole thing in little tiny pieces of post-its. And then I kind of went nuts and I kind of just splattered paint all over it while I covered up the, the drawing that I didn't want paint splatters on. So you can have a lot of fun with these things. So that was a really fun one to do. Um, you can get a lot of really interesting textures with colored pencils from cross hatching to give you interesting um, shading on fabric to going and drawing in different contour lines to get textures of hair um, to reflecting really interesting colors. So we've got um, some portraits here from Doctor Who with some really weird kind of bonkers lighting um, we got a, a portrait of John Lewis here that has some really beautiful um, highlights on him from all the stage lights that I really enjoyed doing. And actually this, this one of the happy guy in a scarf, Tom Baker, that's what I did in my class last year. So I'll be, I'll be looking forward to seeing what I can do this year with my students as we sort of progress and see what we want to make. Here's some details. Um, you can see where paint has gone on top of the pencils to give them some cool uh, additional special effects. And that's something we'll be exploring a lot. Um, and on our right, we just have a work in progress. So we talk about how we plan where our colors and where our textures wanna go. And then we just continue to layer until it looks finished. So that's always really fun to plan out those early stages. So this woman on the right here has some red shading to start with and then some purple and blue just as a fun color palette to play with. And then you just keep adding on top of it until you end up with a finished picture. And at some point you decide that you're done. 
which is the hard part to figure out because you could just do this forever. Um, we're going to talk about creating realistic textures like fur or wool or hair or bark or leaves. That's something we're going to spend a lot of tomorrow exploring, um, which I'm looking forward to because that's always a really fun class. So I don't always draw people. Sometimes I'll draw animals as well. Um, it doesn't translate well in this scan, in this photograph, but using um, metallic inks can also be a really fun thing to add to a drawing that we'll play around with this week. So originally, um, and actually I have the original here. I'll see if I can show it to you all when I'm done sharing my screen. But this is inlaid with really sparkly gold paint. So this is from a, um, a book in a show called American Gods and this person is a god. So I wanted to do like a sort of like sort of religious iconography even though it's definitely a fictional uh, book. But again, using um, colored pencils to start with and then adding and sprinkling in other media is a really fun thing to do with this supply. Um, so here's just a couple of other things that I've done. Um, Anthony Bourdain, I did this one last year. Uh, he's got a really fun face to draw because it was covered in like the very hard life that he had, lots of like wrinkles and um, sort of a chiseled face. So that was a, a fun one to draw even though we unfortunately lost him fairly early on. Here's some watercolor that we can do as a background for colored pencils. And you can also, because watercolor soaks into paper, you can also make a watercolor background and do your entire drawing on top of it. Um, Linda did a little bit of that in her presentation as well. So the short of it is that when we're in our class, we're mostly using colored pencils and learning about this really versatile accessible user-friendly media and seeing what we can do with it. But we're also taking it a couple steps further and sort of maybe stepping out of that colored pencil comfort zone and seeing, well, we've got our colored pencil, but what else can we do to it? How far can we push this stuff? Can we try this out? Does it work? Does it not work? So we've already started exploring that a little bit, which is one of my most favorite things to do. Um, and that's mostly what I have here. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna get that uh, picture that has the gold paint on it so I can show you that as well. So let me stop sharing, oh, I'm back. Um, but these are really fun to have reflective colors in. So before I can find it, this watch I won't be able to, it was here earlier today. Oh, there we go. So if this shows up on camera, you can kind of see the gold paints on there have a shimmer. Um, and actually, I used this as a demo last year talking about found textures that you can use for your drawings as well. So you put something bumpy under a paper, and you take a pencil and you scratch over it. What textures does it produce? How would you maybe use that in a drawing? Um, you know, onion netting you could use. You could use, I don't know. Uh, a wooden table and get that wooden texture in there. You can really use anything um, because colored pencils are user friendly. And that's it. They're a really fun medium. And I love teaching this class because everyone is successful and everyone comes up with something really cool. And that's probably all I have. There we go. Well, thank you, Kelsey. I don't know whether Janet will be able to get back on the the storm increased and she was afraid so she turned her computer off. I've invited her back. We'll see if the storm subsides. Mm -hmm. The three of you have so much in common. It was really fun to for me to plan this talk and I know for our audience to hear your presentations. Some of the things that you have in common. Of course, the first obvious one is the surface. What kinds of paper, the two of you mix so many medias with your work. Um, Janet's using mostly pencil and charcoal. What kinds of paper do you select as the basis for your expression? Oh, that was one of our questions today is uh, dealing with different papers. Um, I have a preferred paper that I love that I'll go back to over and over again. It's Reeves BFK and I was introduced to it in drawing classes and printmaking classes when I went to Maryland Institute. And I, I, it's to this day I still order it by the case. But because this is a mixed media class 
and I said, well, you know, if you have a favorite paper that you like, something that can take a little abuse or not. Um, let's see what happens. If you want to try doing some kind of collage with papers and then working on top of it, that's an option too. But um, for a lot of these demo pieces that I do, I use uh, usually a mixed media paper, something that will take water if, you know, if we need to, because we often start with a wet background and allow that to dry and then work on top of it. Um, I love, you know, Kelsey's talk with all the, the, I mean, you're saying exactly what I love doing. You know, you just keep working the layers and you keep applying it, but hot press and cold press watercolor paper make interesting comparisons too, because with the cold press, you have all the little bumps, which can create a whole nother texture for you. And I do the same thing. I put paper on top of a surface and allow that surface to come through and create some background texture for me. And sometimes it's done by accident and sometimes it's done on purpose. So the choice of paper is wide. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that as well. Um, depending on your colored pencils, if you're someone who really likes to color lightly, you can use pretty much any paper you like. If you're someone who really wants to kind of like dig in there and make those pencils almost look like marker or paint, you're probably going to want a thicker paper. But um, Honestly, the thing that I usually use to practice with, this is just computer uh, cardstock paper that I got from Walmart. Um, benefit of it being, it comes in enormous packages. Uh, it's not very expensive. And if I make a mistake as you're experimenting uh, and as my students experiment with stuff, you're not out a whole lot of money or effort and you're like, oh, it's okay. I've got 500 more sheets of this or whatever. But if I wanna do something fancy, I'll probably use like a thicker Bristol. You can use white paper or you can use colorful paper and get some really weird, cool, glowy effects depending on whatever color you use, which is fun. One of the things that amongst the three of you is a commonality and it's not common amongst all artists. Some artists, especially a wood carver like Cliff Santiago, for example, has to have pretty much a firm idea of the finished product when they begin, because basically he's a subtractive sculptor. He does put additive parts on, but he's a subtractive sculptor. And whoops, and changing a, a wooden sculpture is kind of hard. But one of the things the three of you stress, and I think Janet probably plans her pieces out more than the two of you, you're confident and you're experimental and the spontaneity is what makes you happy. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and I must admit, I'm that way too. I tell my students I'm not a cookie cutter teacher. I don't expect all their work to, to look alike. Uh, even though I'm teaching techniques, each person interprets it individually. I think you two are probably the same way. And rather than work from a recipe, it's really fun to solve the problems as you go along and have the confidence in your skill set that whatever happens, you can make it work. I feel like there's also something to be said about if you do make a mistake, how do you make it work in your favor? Because I feel like probably back in, you know, old Renaissance time, like Linda said, people stained their paper with coffee. I'm sure that came from somebody accidentally just spilling stuff on their paper, them going, oh, it's my last piece, what do I do? And they were just like, you know what? I definitely did it on purpose. I'm gonna draw over, it's gonna be fine. Whew. Like, <laughs> I think it's probably a lot of it. <laughs> So true, so true. And earlier you had made the comment about, you know, you just have a piece of cardstock and, you know, it's only paper. And I use that line today with my students. I said, you know, we are just learning technique. I don't want you to think you have to draw like me. In fact, I don't want you to draw like me. I just want you to use your own hand and I'm teaching you techniques. I'm teaching you kind of the rules of drawing, but then I want you to, you know, go wherever you go with them. And if you need to break a few rules and just, you know, see what happens with that. But yeah, it's only paper. It's only a few pieces of medium. You just let yourself be relaxed, enjoy it, have fun with it, and create. Yeah. It's obvious in Janet's work that she is extremely influenced by a culture where she resided for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, and through her reading and her dialect, you can hear that she's 
pretty much mastered that language and is fluent. Yeah. And she also reads some of the ancient languages and includes a lot of those in the signature seals uh, that, that she carves. Linda, I know your travels influence your work. Um, is there a particular culture that influences your work? Oh, it's um, there. Are, there's a lot of different cultures that influence it, but um, I must say that a lot of the the natural things in life are influ influenced by the Native American culture. Uh, their philosophy on life, on nature, and how you should treat nature in order to prosper this land that's one of my biggest influences. So it's like there's a connection with everything. I believe that we're all one molecular structure and that we're all connected and you have to honor nature. So that's my biggest influence. Kelsey, with you, it's obviously pop culture. Probably. <laughs> the edge of pop culture. You're one of the inventors of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I certainly like to add like a little bit of like a comic book movie flair to a lot of what I draw. A lot of what I do is um, like portraiture of, you know, other artists who I admire or, you know, animals and stuff from nature. But like with some sort of like a comic book twist, you know, the colors are popping, the, the textures are a little bit exaggerated and stuff. So I don't know. Yeah, probably pop culture. I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right, probably. Well, and you created, you didn't show any of your your animals, but you've created a series of animals that, that you've had mass produced and sell. Mm -hmm. have yeah, you, I should have brought one out. I did. You've done books? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So, um, a lot of illustration stuff. Uh, I will use colored pencils in almost everything that I do, even if you know, it's originally a watercolor painting or a marker thing. I have to put colored pencils in there or I might explode. Um, <laughs> they're just so useful for everything. Anything, it's like, it's like, it's like the chocolate of the art world. I mean, you can pretty much improve anything by putting chocolate on anything. You can improve pretty much any piece of artwork by putting some colored pencil in there, even if it's just a hint. I love that quote. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things we've we've been talking about it's it's an age old argument. Um, is it craft or is it art? Is craftsmanship does that mean that it's well done and functional, or can is fine art well crafted? What do you th What are your opinions of, about the difference between fine art and craft? I've always kind of held to the belief that everything is art. Everything you do, everything you create is a form of art. I mean, they can make it at different levels, fine art, art, illustrated art, but it's all art. Um, I think fine, finely crafted pottery is in itself an art form. Um, I've tried making pottery and I, I'm not I'm not very good at it. It, it. My hands just don't work that way. And so it's like, for that's a whole other art form that I don't, you know, I'm not accomplished at. So I, when I can, I buy it. So it's like, I can't make it. So I prefer to buy that beautiful piece of art. So for me, everything, everything is art. A well-written book, a beautiful outfit. Your hat is a gorgeous example of art. So it's like everything to me is art. I don't make a boundaries of, oh, it's a craft piece or it's a fine art piece. You know, I just like it all. I think it's probably really objective. I think I always understood craft to be something that is functional and useful, like the mug I've been drinking out of the whole time. I love this mug. It's, you know, it's like the size of a trash can, but, you know, I never run out of water in it. And it's really beautiful. So it happens to be something that is a beautiful art piece that is also something functional. So I think it's a craft and fine art. But like, I think at the same time, fine art doesn't always have to be useful. And maybe, yeah, I don't think that fine art always has to have a particular use for it. But I don't know, I've seen a lot of, like, I'm not very good at pottery either. I, I should be. My mom's a potter. I'm an embarrassment to my genetic lineage, but 
if I tried making a piece of pottery, it would not be a beautiful fine art. It would be mud that has just been cooked for a very long time that you might be able to drink out of if you're lucky. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, students are always interested in how to present their work. And there's been some argument about glass, plexiglass, non-glare glass, whether to mat glass and frame or just what, what are your thoughts on presenting the drawings in the mixed media work once they're completed? Hmm, back to options again. Um, for my work, a lot of it having to do with charcoal and pastel, plexi is not a good option because of the static that's created it you literally will transfer your drawing to the plexi um, if you put it in there and so the, I, it's in some galleries some shows will say they won't accept your work unless it's in plexi so if I will do that but I don't like to and I don't spray my art heavily um, so if I spray it at all it's very lightly and my the way I handle pastel is not thick amounts of pastel on it or heavy duty. I tone my paper, I'm using a light hand. So I don't have a lot of that residual pastel and charcoal that's falling to the bottom of the frame. And that way, you know, it's it's not as bad with plexi, but I don't like plexi on that type of work. Um, if you're dealing with something that's very dark and you're dealing with uh, drawing on black paper or doing a dark a pastel charcoal kind of piece if you try framing it with regular glass anywhere in the room that has any kind of glare you're not going to see your image so that's where you start getting into do I use non glare do I use museum glass and you know what am I going to put on this does it have to go in a gallery is it just for my own personal use and where is it located so you know there's a lot of it comes down to technicalities you know, it's like where is it going and what's it for I prefer a non-glare glass, but I don't like some of the non-glares that have almost like a haze to them. Mm -hmm. um, so museum glass is definitely a much higher quality and better to use. And I will use that on some of the pieces that I know that are going into nicer shows. In my own home where I can regulate, I can use just regular glass and you know not have to deal with the glare. But for me, it comes down to technicalities. It's like, where is it going? What's it used for? And Plexi's not my favorite. <laughs> Do you have to use a heavier mat to remove the work from the glass? Um, not really. I mean, if you've got a, a, a good mat board, like a four ply, it's going to keep it away from the glass. If you're going to try, if you can't do that really with Plexi, because like I said, the static will actually pull the, it off. Um, I've gone to framing against the glass a lot. Uh, I like that look on a lot of my pieces. And so I actually do the technique where you're putting your image against the glass and you tape it along the glass edge and then you frame it in the frame. So it, it becomes a lot more, less issue of the glare also because it's already against the glass part and the glass is pH neutral so it's not going to do any damage to your work. And you always use acid free mat board when you use mat board? Oh definitely yeah everything I use I I told my students if you're going to do a nice piece and you want to keep it around for 20 years or give it to your children use asset free products otherwise it'll turn your image yellow and it'll start on the back with little specklies and you know, do great damage. Please don't use cardboard. <laughs> Any comments about matting and framing as we conclude, Kelsey? Um, I, I wish I had some really good framing wisdom. I honestly don't. Um, because of just the nature of what I do, most of the display of my work is just done with a scan on a computer. And most people see my work digitally. I know that when in the past I've done um, the Rice Gallery at Common Ground, I just put them in a frame. Um, there is the glare, and I know it's a very bright room, which is gorgeous to see artwork in, um, but it's just the nature of it. It's just behind a glass frame that I get at Michael's. 
<laughs> it's just a really simple. I wish I had more information on it. Like, I feel like I should know more about this. I'm going to have to pick your brains about it. Yeah. Um, but, like, one of the things that colored pencils does, because this has clay in it, and I don't know how well it will show up, but over time, um, places that have high pigment, like reds and blacks, will look foggy. So you will have to frequently, over time, take it out of its frame and give it a little smudge, and suddenly this side is way darker than the side next to it. You can probably see that a bit. Um, good reason I wore a dark hoodie today. Uh, so at least what I do requires some maintenance over time. So, like, now there's this, like, comically large dark circle of smear that i've burnished this a bit so i don't know what the solution for colored pencil is to prevent any of that buildup over time without just frequently cleaning it i'm not sure yeah i don't think there is a solution yet because i i know a number of a color pencil artists and that's a struggle that they've been trying to contact the makers of the products and say what can be done about this yeah, like, I don't think that there is. I think it's just, you know, once in a while, you got to go and visit your artwork up close and personal. Like, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, how you doing? So you just got to do that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a wonderful art talk about drawing and mixed media. Join us tomorrow night. I'm not teaching this summer because people just don't have a settle in torches, upright sanders and tumblers and buffers hanging around the house. So unacceptable. Uh, I'll be showing uh, a group of my work to encourage people to sign up for those 3D classes we are so sorely missing this season. So Keith Taylor and I will share the talk tomorrow. And of course, we'll deal with craft versus fine art uh, as we look at shaker tape woven seats and the traditional arts um, of metal smithing and furniture. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Please don't miss the keynote address with Don and Ellen Elms and David Carrasco. It's going to be absolutely wonderful uh, tonight. Uh, that's at 8 o'clock, the same channel that you're on right now. See you tomorrow night. If I don't see you at the concert. Bye. Good night. <laughs>